Wild Health is about optimizing you. We use genomics, blood work, biometrics, microbiome assessment, many other tests, and a conversation with you to come up with a full health optimization plan. What's the perfect diet, exercise, and supplement plan for you and only you? The Wild Health Podcast is about optimizing all of us. Here we cover the cutting-edge science that gives you the base to be able to apply the personalized plan we give you as a patient. To sign up as a patient, go to wildhealth.com. Or if you're a physician or health coach and you want to learn how to do this for your patients, we're happy to help as well. Wildhealth.com for all the information on becoming a patient or working with us. Hi, everybody. It's Mike. Uh, just wanted to give a quick um, warning about this episode. So this podcast episode contains a discussion including sensitive topics related to PTSD, mental health, and suicide. Our discussion touches on personal uh, perspective and experiences and some emotional content. Listener discretion is advised. If you or someone you know is struggling with these issues, please seek professional help and or contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988 or 988lifeline.org. Hey, welcome to the Wild Health Podcast. My name is Kristen Dawson, and today I'm joined by Ben Doc Askins and Dr. J Dave Jobes. So Dr. Jobes is a expert in the field of suicidology. He's a professor of psychology at the Catholic University of America, and he's the director of the CUA Suicide Prevention Lab. He's developed the suicide treatment that we'll be discussing today called CAMS. That stands for the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. We're very fortunate that Dr. Jobes was able to be here today. He happened to be flying into town to join our colleague, Dr. Melinda Moore, in some Suicide Prevention Month events. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jobes. Thank you so much for having me, Kristen. I'm glad to be with you. Wonderful. Well, as our listeners may have um, guessed by now, today we have a topic that can be, su um, can be sensitive, and we're talking about suicide. Yep. So I really just wanted to emphasize um, and encourage people to take care of themselves as they listen today. Uh, one of the benefits of having a podcast is that you can turn it off at any time, right? Um, and we'll also mention that there is a new National Suicide Prevention Lifeline mm -hmm. that can be uh, reached, and that's by dialing 988. So the 988 Lifeline provides 24-7 access to a national network of local crisis centers. It's providing free support to anyone in a suicidal crisis. All right, so we're going to be diving into three main topics today. So number one, I'd like to discuss with Dr. Jobes the psychological factors that contribute to suicide risk. We're going to talk, obviously, about CAMS as a tool to both evaluate and treat suicidality effectively. And then we'll talk a little bit about some community suicide prevention efforts and resources. All right, so all that being said, <laughs> Dr. Jobes, I wanna hear you speak. Um, one of the things that I have heard both from people in the community as well as actually some patients um, that I've encountered, um, when there's been a suicide loss, a lot of times people will say something along the lines of, I just can't understand why someone would do that mm. uh, in reference to suicide. And I know you spent your career, really, trying to understand that question. So can you walk us through or help us understand some of the most important psychological factors that, that seem to contribute to suicide? Yeah, I've been at this for a long time, Kristen, 40 years, ever since graduate school. And, and we continue to learn um, in the years that I've been involved in this field, um, different ways of thinking about this. For in our training, probably as a psychiatrist and a psychologist, we you know a lot of us learn about risk factors, and those tend to be psychosocial correlates of people that die by suicide. So in our country, for example, middle-aged white males and males in general are about 80% of our suicides, um, and that's been a very big demographic. But that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So the goal has been to try to isolate it or, or um, have more specificity. So beyond sort of broad demographics, we know that men die by suicide and they use guns. We know that typically women attempt suicide and tend to overdose. Um, but that doesn't mean that women don't die by suicide, men don't make attempts. So there's a kind of a circularity in how these things get discussed. 
Certainly psychiatric disorders, mental disorders are a part of the picture. Um, typically we're thinking of depression or psychotic disorders, anxiety disorders, substance abuse, all of the above. Um, but then again, one of the challenges is every patient I see has a mental disorder diagnosis and they're not all suicidal. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that, that depression and suicide are synonymous is actually not true even remotely. Out of 130 Americans that will die by midnight tonight, about 40 or 50 of them will be depressed. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, there's these misunderstandings about how psychopathology plays into the picture. And it, while it's almost always on board, the, the people that break for suicide have a different set of considerations. And a lot of that goes to um, hopelessness, um, a desire for escaping their pain and suffering. Uh, it might be that they feel like they're a burden to their loved ones and that they're doing their loved ones actually a favor, um, which may sound crazy to people, but in the mind's eye of someone who's suicidal having a very difficult time in life, they can see that their suicide is a, kind of a gift. And as a clinician, I've brought in family members, they pretty much across the board say, no, no, that's not true. But uh, for some people, um, when they think about suicide, uh, reality gets distorted and uh, parts of their brain, the limbic system in particular, you know, is getting activated um, and people are getting highly dysregulated. And as you know, when that happens, sometimes the prefrontal cortex kind of goes offline and that's a recipe for, for trouble, especially if there's alcohol on board or ready access to firearms. So we tend to think about things that kind of converge, you know, that come together in a moment of crisis. And that's where a lot of the treatments tend to focus is trying to figure out how does somebody get in trouble? Um, and then what to, to do when they get in trouble? So risk factors has been one approach to kind of think about um, who we're talking about. Um, in more recent years, there's been a, more of a discussion about warning signs. And warning signs, if you think as a cardiologist might, are patients who have maybe lots of risk factors for heart disease, but they're not having radial pain in their arm or chest pains or feeling dizzy. Those are more proximate indicators of someone being maybe close to a myocardial infarction and a heart attack. So so we've been moving the field into that, thinking about there are people with risk factors and then there are people with suicidal warning signs. And most of those tend to focus on acute states of agitation, dysregulation, psychotic states, um, uh, lo significant loss of sleep where people aren't getting enough REM sleep and getting agitated. Um, so these agitated states are ones that um, suicidologists are very dialed into because they, they get us to more proximity of where a, a behavior might actually be um, sort of possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned in your book, and we'll talk a little bit about the book uh, maybe later, but um, this concept of um, kind of three three particular factors um, that come together. It's called the Schneidman cubic model. Yeah. I don't know if, you know, I know you know what I'm talking about, but, yeah. it, but it seems like psychological pain coupled with that state of agitation that you mentioned. Correct. In addition to some overwhelming stressors stress yeah. in their life, that, that maybe the, you know, those are three things that if they're at their peak um, would be one of the more acute warning signs or states. Yeah, if, you're, if we're trying to operationalize as clinicians, clear and imminent danger. Mm -hmm. Ed Schneiman, who's one of the early founding fathers of the field, came up with this notion of psych ache, mm -hmm. um, which was a, a neologism to kind of describe a pain that's unique to suicide. Mm -hmm. Different than depression, different than anxiety, maybe angst gets to it, you know, an angst or a, a level of desperation or despair that just can't be born. Mm -hmm. And so when people are in this acute state of, of psychological pain or psych ache, um, and the world is kind of caving in on them, uh, their, their, their kids don't talk to them, they're gonna, for, they're gonna lose their mortgage, uh, their house is gonna foreclose, they've been unemployed. Uh, you know, a number of things have been uh, um, sort of coming down on them and impinging on their well-being. And then this, this really key piece of, of agitation is, is one, he called it perturbation. Mm -hmm. I like to make up words, but the idea of perturbation is this extremely distressed, agitated state mm -hmm. um, where this pre prefrontal cortical control is kind of lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people are in that state, uh, they might need to go to the hospital or they might need 
an acute intervention like a benzodiazepine or some sort of arketamine. I mean, we can we can talk about medications, but um, the idea is that they're they're in a really dangerous mm -hmm. space psychologically, and then it's also a great model from a clinical standpoint because if you can decrease the pain or if I'm working with a college student and one of their stressors is that they think they're going to flunk out, mm -hmm. we talk to the dean of students, mm -hmm. maybe we get some incompletes and a withdrawal from certain classes, they don't have to flunk out of college, you've now removed that stressor. Mm -hmm. If we have the patient practice mindfulness or we use medication or other techniques to kind of bring down the agitated state, then removing the person out of that sort of lethal, synergistic, perfect storm yeah. uh, of that model. Mm -hmm. So models like that are really hot right now because they they tend to be these convergence models that have a lot of clinical utility mm -hmm. because they give us targets for us to go after to try to take somebody who's in an acute state and sort of move them into a safer place, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Do you find that patients find that helpful? Kind oh, of yeah. saying, oh, here are these three things that are that are kind of bearing down on you. And maybe I can't do immediately something about this one, but I think we can make some some changes with number two and number three, or you know, something oh, yeah. along those lines. Yeah, I, I would say the effect of treatments. If you look, for example, at the cognitive therapy treatment or BCBT, brief cognitive behavioral therapy, they'll have a whiteboard in the office, and they'll draw out the suicidal mode, mm. and we'll identify your triggers and your history that then activate certain cognitions, certain thoughts. Mm -hmm certain physiological reactions, certain behaviors, um, certain emotions, and how those get kicked off for you, the patient. Right. And then we would talk about how we'd sort of target those things to sort of help you manage the mode when it kicks in. So a lot of us that do these treatments are, are very keen on sort of working models, mm -hmm. uh, giving the patient, uh, one way to think of it is making the patient their own suicidologist mm -hmm. to sort of learn who, what, when, where, and how they get in trouble, and then when they do, what what can they do? And a lot of what they can do is try to re-engage this part of the brain that yeah. can now down-regulate or bring back cortical control um, with people who are feeling really out of control. Yeah. Sort of personalized suicide prevention. Yeah, yeah. very much. Could one I interject and ask a question? Sure. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Schneidman's book, Suicide is Psychic, that he published back, I think it was the early 90s. I mean, he was decades ahead of his time. You're right as far as, like, he's kind of eccentric in the way he uses some oh, yeah. language, like a lot of geniuses, but he oh, was yeah. way out ahead of the curve as far as publishing stuff on sort of the insider's perspective on suicidality. And you raised the distinction between folks who are depressed and folks who are acutely suicidal previously and that a lot of times depression involves these thinking habits or loops and then low energy and then in school they told us that as you start to try to help someone become undepressed sometimes they still have those thinking loops and habits of thought but they start to get some energy back which could be agitation could be positive energy but I wondered if you'd be willing to comment on sort of a a period of time after someone begins treatment where they're still potentially at higher risk for suicidality, even though things are, are making a turn in the, the direction of anti-depression. Yeah, I, I have a zillion associations to that, Ben, but the one, the one I'm really thinking about is um, perseveration. Um, so for example, we published a study a few years ago where the, um, the patients might respond to different kinds of queries on an assessment tool that we used. And the patient says, a soldier um, in one of our trials, who's my wife, my wife, my wife, my marriage, my wife, my wife, and um, just is very much preoccupied or perseverating or ruminating over one particular issue um, in their life. And we've seen now with college students and with active duty soldiers, in this case, infantry soldiers, um, that people that have this perseverative style um, are have more suicidal ideation and more severe suicidal ideation. And treatment-wise, it's been very tough to treat. Um, and I even had a psychiatrist colleague of mine at Mount Sinai saying, with one case where we actually lost a patient in one of our trials, he could have really benefited from a neuroleptic uh, or an antipsychotic to, to bring more cortical control, because basically the perseveration in these written responses is a manifestation of loss of control. 
And what was fascinating about this study is that suicidologists are very, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it's, I don't want to talk about the same way. But maybe we'll get back to your question. I, I love whatever you're saying, regardless of whether yeah. you answer the original question right. or not. We'll, we'll get back if we need to. But, but, the, but suicidologists are very preoccupied with rumination because if any of us ruminate, it's never good. And if you have suicidal thoughts on board, it's especially problematic. And um, and this one case where we lost a patient in one of our trials was heartbreaking because we watched these videos in a randomized control trial for adherence purposes. Very invested in this guy um, and this patient's well-being. And he just could not unhear um, a particular fight that he had with his wife where she disclosed way too much information about a past relationship. And it kind of ate him alive. Um, and so we, we see it as a, a as a a pattern or a way that the, the brain is sort of stuck in a loop that they can't break out of. And we, we thought about EMDR, we thought about ECT. I mean, we we're really trying to think, how do we, how do we sort of re, um, like reboot this guy's way of thinking about things because it was so destructive and ultimately you know, it was central to his taking his own life. Did that answer your question at all? I think you're also probably talking about when people get better and then seem to um, I mean, that, that speaks to the energy that it takes, you know, to actually pull the trigger or, or do something lethal. Right. Someone so, so who's got the leaden symptoms of depression isn't going to do that, but then their yeah. arms and legs don't feel tired anymore, and what's the first thing they think of doing with them? Exactly. Maybe. Which is one of the concerns about the SSRIs, the serotonin-specific uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, is that they, they have this activating effect. I don't think they cause suicidal cognitions, but if you got those on board and you get like a hypo hypomanic reaction from the medication in the short term, that can actually increase your risk because it takes a lot of energy mm -hmm. to override, you know, the sort of the, the, the how we're wired, which is to want to survive. Um, so for me as a clinician, and probably you've seen this as well, a dysphoric depression is less worrisome to, to me than an agitated depression or a psychotic depression where there's a lot of this, you know, um, intensity. You, I think you've described it as um, energy to that you have to do something with the energy. It's An not emergency. just I was um, not able to get out of bed and now I can get out of bed and take a shower kind of energy, right? It's right. I have so much internal um, activation that there, there, something has to come of it. I have to do something with that energy. I think that's maybe the distinction yeah. with a hypomanic or an SSRI-induced mania. Or in bipolar disorder, you know, with a right. manic episode. I mean, that it's a kind of an urgency right. that just can't be... A pressure, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, okay. Um, I guess along this line of kind of risk factors, um, one of the things that you've spent a lot of time researching is, is a risk assessment that's part of the CAMS treatment. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind kind of just walking us through why it's so important, perhaps, to to do a formal assessment uh, of risk? And, and um, I, I know you may mention that not a lot of clinicians necessarily do that yeah. right now, and, and why you think it's so important. Um, I just, as a clinical psychologist, I was always raised, you know, to, to, to and I teach clinical interviewing, so it's a big it's a big passion of mine. And what I really have come to see. Um, through a lot of different experiences, is for a person who's suicidal, um, how powerful it is to, to genuinely sit down with them and be present to them, unpacking their story and um, and describing what they're going through. Um, we just got done with a study um, with people who have lived experience, mm. which in this business are people who either made attempts or have been suicidal or maybe are currently suicidal. And it was a, a pure purely um, research study, qualitative study, where we ask people to describe um, their relationship to suicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, on, a, on a spectrum, a 100 millimeter line, with suicide and life, you know, where would they mark themselves? And um, these were mind-blowing interviews. They were mind-blowing interviews because people were incredibly candid. Mm -hmm. They were, they taught me things that I had never quite heard. I, for example, there was one person that really impressed me. She said, I'm doing really well, but I'm going to die by suicide. Oh, wow. And I don't want any of you doctor types taking that away from me. This is my death. And uh, I keep it in my back pocket, and it comforts me, and I live with it. Mm -hmm. I live because of it. 
And so I'm like, oh, you know, I was like pushing this idea of a post-suicidal life that everybody would want to be not suicidal. And these people were not necessarily not wanting mm -hmm. to not wanting to not be suicidal, if that makes sense. So what was interesting to me was how much these people opened up. And I think one of the reasons they did was they knew that we were going to be able to hear it. We were not going to freak out and we we're not going to call police. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did have in the informed consent form, if you're in imminent danger, which nobody knows what that is, but if you're in imminent danger, we will be bound to do what we can to intervene. But short of clear and imminent danger, we, we can tolerate and want to hear what you have to say. And that goes to a really important point, Kristen, which is that a lot of clinicians, and there's research on this, don't want to know. There's a study that came out about six or eight years ago where providers were act, asking questions like, you don't want to kill yourself, do you? Or, you know, in a in a way that clearly primed a desired response versus a really open-ended you know, question that would open somebody up. And so um, to me, what, what the assessment that we use in CAMS does is it creates a, a roadmap that we do literally sitting side by side um, if the patient's comfortable with that or we do it online as well. Um, we're going through an assessment tool where the, the patient is rating different constructs that we have studied and, and understand we think know pretty well. And then they're actually writing out descriptions. So for psychological pain, they'll rate their pain from one to five. And then the prompt is, you know, what do I find most painful? And they'll describe what that is. And when the clinician just hears that and takes it in and is present to it, um, it's a therapeutic assessment. It's been deemed as such in a meta-analysis. It's an assessment in which the patient finds just the questions and the way they're being asked is therapeutic in itself, completely separate from the treatment. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very much a fan of clinicians finding a way to tolerate really opening up the discussion, mm -hmm. not asking leading questions, and really hearing through what people have to say without immediately jumping you know, to call the police or have this person committed against their will. I haven't committed a patient ever, and the last person I hospitalized was probably 20 years ago. Wow. Now, I've got a very high tolerance, probably more than most, but my view is that most people um, who struggle with this can be effectively treated on an outpatient basis very responsibly and safely. There's still always going to be a need for inpatient care. I feel like our inpatient care needs to be more suicide specific, mm -hmm. but I feel the vast majority of these folks, and we're talking in our country about 15,600,000 American adults and teenagers who, according to SAMHSA research, say they have serious thoughts of suicide in 2021. Wow. 15.6 million. So that's about 300 times greater than people that die by suicide. Mm -hmm. And we act like those people don't matter when those people matter a lot. Mm -hmm. And if we were better at identifying them upstream and treating them there, you know, my contention would be fewer of them would go on to attempt and die by suicide. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, in the National Health Service, you can't get dialectical behavior therapy unless you make an attempt. Really? Short of an attempt, you get supportive counseling. Oh, wow. So there you have a health system that's operantly conditioning patients to ramp up to a behavior mm -hmm. so they get DBT. <laughs> Which is a behavioral intervention to reduce suicidality. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, so um, you, you mentioned um, lived experience with uh, suicide attempts, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a book that had just been published this month called The Art of Being Broken, How Storytelling Saves Lives by my friend Kevin Hines. Oh, and okay. he has made an effort uh, at getting his story out there, and it's a beautiful story. He made an attempt jumping off of the Golden Great Brit of all places, which, you know, there's a whole um, mythos surrounding suicidology and the Golden Gate Bridge that he delves into there. But I know we got a lot of clinicians and a lot of non-clinicians as listeners, and the yeah. clinicians would benefit from the studies that you're mentioning. But for everybody else, I just wanted to mention, if that's something that's of interest to you, I can't more highly recommend a book than Kevin's book. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin's an amazing person who literally has traveled the world telling his story about, I think it's like 18% of people have survived falls off the Golden Gate Bridge, and he literally, like his body was crushed and broken, and mm. uh, it's an incredible story. And so anything that Kevin does is pretty much on the money because he's he has gone through that experience and lived the tall tale and has been a, a major leader in our field in the, from the lived experience perspective. 
Well, I, I do appreciate your collaborative approach with patients because I think um, some folks have been conditioned to either not admit that they're having these thoughts or um, very quickly say, I mean, it, you know, I'm having these thoughts, but I'm not going to do it right away, and I don't have a plan. I mean, it's like they know what to say because there is a fear of being hospitalized right. against their will. Um, and so there is this um, sense of fear and, um, you know, distrust almost with mental health providers, unfortunately, um, from the patient perspective. And so um, I think this particular approach would appeal to a lot of people. Can you tell us what, what it would be like for a patient who decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up for a CAMS treatment, I'm going to find a provider, what would therapy look like for them? What would their experience be like? It would be different than what was typical. So um, the, the CAMS approach really tries to address that front and center. Mm -hmm. There's research that there are patients who are suicidal who are afraid to talk about suicide because they don't want to be hospitalized. There's research that shows that clinicians are avoidant of the mm -hmm. topic because they're afraid of liability mm -hmm. and malpractice litigation, and they don't want to lose somebody. So kind of don't ask, don't tell. In CAMS, we sort of like flip that script. Mm -hmm. And um, quite literally, within the first five minutes, if, if suicide is a consideration for us, I'd ask to take a seat next to the patient for doing on telehealth. I'd pull up my screen, and we'd share, you know, share a screen where we look at the suicide status form and I would hand it to the patient to start completing it. And I'm right there, um, sort of going through it with them, answering questions, making comments, making certain observations. And it takes like 15, 20 minutes. And what occurs in that assessment is quite extraordinary in my experience because patients feel like you get it. You, you understand what I'm going through. You're not judging me. You can hear this. I'm not freaking you out. That's really comforting to me. We get to the next page. I'll take the clipboard. Now we'll ask about risk and warning signs, attempt history, lethal means, nature of your suicidal thoughts, substance abuse, to then arrive at the treatment plan. And you're going to be my co-author as the patient of your own treatment plan. I'm the licensed provider, so i got to complete it. But the first step in the treatment plan is to develop a stabilization plan, mm -hmm. which is how you get through your dark moments, um, should you get in a you know, really, really difficult, acute state, things that you can do. And then uh, we finish off that first session by identifying the two problems that you, the patient, says make you consider suicide. And we call these drivers in CAMS. Um, the express goal is to try to keep somebody out of the hospital. And the way we can keep somebody out of the hospital is when we do the stabilization plan, if lethal means can be made secure, if a gun can be secured by a third party or a stash of pills, you know, or a loose door on the top of a residence hall can be made secure. And we work through uh, a, a solid stabilization plan and the patient seems to be on board. We don't have to hospitalize. Mm -hmm. um, and for a lot of people, that's really good news. Um, and so that launches the initial um, work in CAM. So there's a first session that's pretty labor intensive in terms of assessment and tr the treatment plan that's focused on drivers. Um, and then there's interim care where every session begins with a quick core assessment of the, the key variables that we look at, kind of like um, vital signs. Mm -hmm. Come on to shift and take vital signs. Yeah. So it's the vital signs of suicidal risk as we think about it. Every session begins that way. And then we could spend the whole session talking about the driver of trauma. We could do prolonged exposure, or we could do insight work, uh, we could do some therapeutic journaling, you know, like whatever the clinician wants to do to treat the driver, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. We're gonna sort of take another look at your stabilization plan. Is it working? Do we have to tweak it? Do you change it? There's other sort of tools that we can use, but every interim session ends by going back to that treatment plan saying, okay. So trauma and your, uh, and your boyfriend leaving you are the two things, you know, now we had this thing that came out today, which is that you've got intimacy problems and it looks like it's connected to some of the sexual abuse. And so we might modify that treatment plan to focus more now on sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. and we call that sharpening the driver, getting more to the root. Um, and so we do that interim care just like that until criteria are met for outcome and disposition. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're looking for is not the complete eradication 
of every vestige of a suicidal thought or feeling. We're looking for managing the thoughts and feelings and behavioral stability for three consecutive sessions, at which point we say, okay, um, we do a final version of the SSF and we call it a day. Mm -hmm. And what we find, Kristen, in the vast majority of these cases, that that's enough. In six to eight sessions, people can come in looking at suicide this way, and by session five or six, they're kind of looking at it this way, and it doesn't feel like it's necessarily the thing that they must do. Mm. In the back of CAM, at back end of CAMs, we really start to sprinkle in plans, goals, hope for the future, reasons for living, a life worth living, mm -hmm. and really kind of introduce that idea because they're not in that place to hear that in the first session. Right. But with progress, that's kind of welcome news. And in the meta-analysis of CAMs, the single biggest effect was for decreasing hopelessness and increasing hope, um, which is a great finding across nine studies that, you know, that that's the kind of the secret sauce, is that it, it doesn't cure somebody, it changes their relationship to suicide, and it sounds audacious, but and maybe their relationship to life mm -hmm. in a way that they can find to uh, make it worth living. Mm. Why, why do you think it's that factor of hopefulness that is the biggest finding with this treatment. I mean, was that what you set out to, to try to do? No, it's, it's like, know, well, that's kind of what you found. I think what we discovered, I mean, Aaron Beck, late Aaron Beck, you know, the founder of Cognitive Therapy, um, was to not really put hopelessness on the on the research map mm -hmm. as the, probably one of the best studied constructs, risk factors, mm -hmm. and it is extremely pernicious and problematic when people have no hope. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it doesn't take a big dose of hope to get somebody through a, a, a dark time. But it does seem to be one of the, the, if we're looking for mechanisms, I think it is one of the key mechanisms of CAMS, probably the alliance and, and hope, and then also um, sort of emotion regulation, kind of DBT stuff, where you're, you're able to tolerate the intense motions. Mm -hmm. um, but hope does seem to be the key ingredient for a lot of the suicide interventions, and certainly that's true for CAMS. Wonderful. Well, um, I was gonna ask about the um, the third edition mm -hmm. of the book that you wrote describing my favorite book, CAMS, right? <laughs> so um, your third edition just came out a month ago. Yeah, in August. Re yeah. Pretty pretty recently. Yep. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you um, certainly why um, why did you write the third book and what kind of were the um, important things uh, you wanted to include in this, which I understand is your last. Last book, right? Or of the last, series, of, yeah. Of the series. Yeah. And so what makes it feel like, okay, this is the place I want to end? I love this book because it feels like the, the capstone of a, of a line of work. Mm -hmm. And the, the intervention is really at least one clinician's struggle to kind of have mastery over this issue. Um, and, you know, and then trying to translate what I was learning into a, a methodology that other people could use. I mean, I remember back in the day, you know, I was working with this very famous psychoanalyst um, at, Master, at uh, Harvard, um, uh, John Maltzberger, who was one of the sort of the, the legendary founders of the field, who talked about countertransference mm -hmm. and hatred towards mm -hmm. the patient that was suicidal. Not, you know, pretty language at all, but, but, but pretty intense. And um, we wrote this chapter together, which is a really exciting thing for me in my career. We talked about empathic fortitude and that clinicians were operating from a place of empathic dread, mm -hmm. and they were functioning as therapist voyeurs, and you know, in, in this fancy language that I uh, thought was so clever at the time. It was actually pretty clever, but, <laughs> you know, because it captured a certain kind of thing where you could kind of be very professional, mm -hmm. but sort of be on the outside looking in at someone struggling yeah. and not really be engaged. Mm -hmm. And so with empathic fortitude, you could go into that space and be the therapist participant. And I would, I would you know, pitch this to, you know, professional audiences, and they'd be like, you know, it, it just like cheerleading empathic fortitude wasn't really working. Mm. So interestingly, I kind of backed into this way of getting people to have a version of that by getting into this kind of shared collaborative space mm -hmm. where the SSF um, is the, the thing that we're going to look at together to deconstruct how, where, why, when you're suicidal, what it means to you to be suicidal, what makes you want to kill yourself. And in so doing, the, the, the patient's more comfortable. The clinician feels like, you know, I, I can work with this. Uh, I'm, I'm not having to, you know, do extreme interventions because this is kind of going well and patients like it and clinicians like it. 
Um, and so uh, that's a long winded story about how it was sort of generated. I was also a Rorschacher back in the day. Really? Uh huh. Wow. So when I was an intern at the VA, I was, I did all the Rorschachs because I taught it um, when I was first at the university. And in the Rorschach, you sit side by side. Oh yeah. And Hermann Rorschach developed these ink blots mm -hmm. early in the early 19th century uh, and brought it to this hospital and had, and, and noticed that schizophrenics responded to ink blots very peculiarly mm -hmm. and differently than other people did. But the the thing about the Rorschach, which I think is imprinted on me and cams was that you, you go through an inquiry where what the patient has perceived is what you actually take down so if they they see a bat on card one you you literally write down what they said that makes it look like a bat to them mm. and a lot of patients really like the rorschach because they're the boss mm -hmm. and they're what the they, expert they're the expert and what they say goes so um uh, the first book was very assessment oriented mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, CAMS is like the first page of the SSF, and they don't know about the rest. And that's fine. That was published in 2006, and that sold about 11,000 copies, which is a, a good selling book in the trade business. The second edition came out in 2016, and that's where we really got gotten into the treatment research. And I know you know about dialectical behavior therapy, and Marsha Linehan was a research mentor to me, and we started doing randomized controlled trials, mm -hmm. much through Marsha's mentorship and encouragement. So we had then at that point three randomized controlled trials. And so it was really looking like this assessment's now moving from a therapeutic assessment into a treatment. Um, and then this third edition is seven trials later. Mm -hmm. um, we've got great data, two meta-analyses, 10 open trials. So it was a, a chance to kind of talk about the assessment, the treatment, and then sort of the back end of what we've learned. Mm -hmm. um, and really, um, a pivot point that I'm super excited about, which sounds, again, audacious, but about the psychology of life and what makes life worth living. Mm -hmm. You know, even Marsha, as much as she promoted that idea famously, right. it's not really operationalized in DBT, as far as I know, per se. Yeah. I mean, there are ideas around it. <clears throat> right. The, the target of quality of life as the third target for, for DBT. Right. right. Yeah. But how to do it. Right. Yeah. Right, and I, I think there are seeds there, but to really um, dial into the meaning of life and mm -hmm. what makes our lives worth living and what gives us purpose and meaning, um, to understand the nature of achievement and expectations and goals, mm -hmm. it's a really fascinating topic. And what's interesting in a Swiss study that got published a couple years ago was that we asked patients in a, a trial there about their reasons for living and reasons for dying, thinking that reasons for living are going to be very protective factors. And in two years of follow-up, reasons for living didn't do anything. Hmm. The patients were entirely focused on reasons for dying hmm. in that first session. And I thought, you know, reasons for living is really a clinician variable. Hmm. It's what we want the patient to see. Hmm. And for somebody who's exquisitely suicidal, it's not really front, for, front and center in their thinking. But in CAMS, it becomes, mm -hmm. it, it, as, as people make progress, we start to bring in a life worth living, plans, goals, hope for the future. Mm -hmm. what, what, would, what can we do to move to a place, move you to a place where not only do you not want to terminate your life, you want to find a way to live it. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a really exciting sort of postscript that's featured in the third edition. So is it fair to say, um, when somebody comes in acutely suicidal, what you're saying is their reason, their list of reasons why death is the option is, is what's attractive to them. are numerous, they're present, they're very, very strong. Yeah. Um, clinicians will oftentimes say, well, what are your reasons for living? Yeah. And try and you or know focus point, on that. Point them out to the point patient. Point them out or yeah. offer them up. How serve them up kids? on a silver platter. Right. I know, you know, X, Y, or Z, right? And that's really, in some cases, invalidating to people. Or that, shaming. Right, right. And, you know, you should be thinking about your kids or et cetera, et cetera. But what it sounds like happens through the course of treatment is the reasons for dying start to fade away, lessen in, in severity, and there comes this point of reasons for living start to gain some traction, and the CAMS therapist um, works with a patient to um, strengthen them further or further develop those reasons for living or put specific goals 
attached to those? How would you describe that? All of that, really. I mean, we had a soldier uh, who served in Afghanistan who had severe combat-related PTSD and lost his kids. Those were his two drivers um, because his wife moved to another state and um, mm -hmm. divorced him. Um, he was a really scary guy. We were scared for homicidal risk and suicidal mm -hmm. risk when we first started working with him. And I described this case in the book where he, he, around session six or eight, says, you know, I feel like I'm understanding that this is not the mission. You know, when I first came in, I'm just in the Humvee, we're driving to suicide, there's no off-road. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm gonna, that's where I'm gonna die. And he said, now we kind of moved up alongside of it and we passed it, and I see it in the rear view mirror, but I'm driving away. And now I want to make a turn. Mm. And to me, that's a metaphor for what this is about. I was thinking about a case as you were talking of a colleague of mine in Oklahoma who had a woman who had been suicidal for 20 years wow. and had used cams for, I think it was 42 sessions. And then they resolved. So this had become a way of life for this woman. Mm. And she gave the clinician this incredibly beautiful card saying, thank you for being patient with me. I, now I think before I act, mm -hmm. I don't feel as suicidal as I once did. Cam spoiled the milk I used to drink. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, you know, I mean, it's, it's what a way to describe, right. yeah. you know, because for her, this was how she knew herself. Mm -hmm. 42 sessions is a lot of treatment, mm -hmm. but to actually- Compared to 20 years of that symptom. Exactly. Wow. So um, those are the stories that kind of stick with you yeah, uh, absolutely. because they, they feel like, hmm, that's really, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Well, I guess I want to, um, we've talked a lot about maybe what someone experiencing suicidality could expect out of this treatment. We've given, I think, clinicians a little bit of a sneak peek sure. as to if they were to decide to learn about CAMS, a little bit about what it would be like. Um, I want to ask you about community members who perhaps encounter a coworker or a loved one or a friend who mention, you know, I'm struggling with some of these thoughts, these suicidal thoughts. Um, what would be, I, I know it's so situation dependent, but can you kind of guide us into what a skillful response or an, you know, a helpful, a more helpful than hurtful response might be for a community member who, who hears that? Yeah, this is like a super hot area in the field right now. Mm -hmm. um, Stacy Friedenthal wrote a book, People Who Love Someone Who's Suicidal. Mm -hmm. I wrote the foreword, so I highly recommend it. But it's a book that describes what to do, mm -hmm. what to say, what not to say, how to say it, what are the resources, what can they learn you know, to be helpful to this person. I just finished a book this weekend by Conrad Michel, who's a Swiss psychiatrist, uh, a book called um, um, Meeting the Suicidal Person. Mm. published by Columbia Press, and it's a beautifully written book by a leading scholar who lost his son to suicide. Mm. And it's got recommendations about what people who are concerned can do. Mm. What I tip, and I bet you Kevin Hines' book does as well. <laughs> I haven't read it, but um, I, I think that's where he goes. Because everybody wants to know what to do. H how do I not make it worse? Mm -hmm. how, do I, how am I not responsible for this person that I say the wrong thing and then they mm. take their lives? And what I would always say from my vantage point is if I could, I can't tell you how many people regret what they didn't do. Mm. You mean I, the loved ones? The loved ones yeah. and family members yeah. and friends. And I, in my own practice, I have people coming to me saying, we're very concerned about our son. He's 28 years old. He, you know, he barely talks to us. We think he's going to kill himself. What can we do? Mm -hmm. And I typically say something like you want to leave it all in the field, so mm -hmm. to speak. You want to feel like I did everything that I could do short of, you know, um, you just want to do everything you can do. So in those cases, I sometimes have people make a hope kit um, or care package, and they put cards and heartfelt letters. Um, there's a book called Choosing to Live that Tom Ellis and Corey Newman wrote for people that are suicidal. There are resources like 988 and the National Text Line. Um, just resources and just we love you and we will do anything for you and give them that box oh, wow. uh, literally give them that you know so that, that care package um, a lot of times when I talk to parents I'm saying the, the best thing you can do to save your child's life is to identify that they're suicidal mm -hmm. 
And the more directly you can ask that, the better. And then be prepared to hear their response and hear it all the way through and try not to flip out, mm. but just really hear it through and do your homework and know a bit about what some of the resources might be and tell them about 988, tell them about the national text line. Mm -hmm. So you can text home to 741741 mm -hmm. and thoughtful people will respond and it's confidential and these people are good at this. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, really uh, my whole goal would be to raise awareness that we have 15.6 million Americans, people that you know, who have serious thoughts of suicide. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get better at identifying who they are and holding out our hand and, and then actually taking their hand mm -hmm. and sort of pulling them out of the despair that they're in, we're going to lose more people. Mm -hmm. One of the really interesting things during the pandemic was that the suicide rate actually for the first time in decades started to dip in 2019, 2020. We were all so excited. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's now going, going back, back up, up. right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, suicidal ideation just kept on marching up. Mm. So we have our work cut out for us, but I think podcasts like this to me is, this is where I'm spending a lot of my time these days, mm -hmm. is just trying to raise as much awareness as possible mm -hmm. because these people that we're talking about don't know what else to do. And there's so much else they can do. They just can't see it. Right. So if we're part of helping to see that, that can be a life-saving move and you will not regret it. Mm. I appreciate that so much. I. I don't think I'd heard about a loved one creating a hope kit. I know that patients sometimes will create yeah. um, kind of their own kit of, of things that are comforting or helpful in a crisis, but the idea that a loved one could put in the you know 988 number and the text number and books from people who have had lived experiences and I mean I think that's a wonderful idea. I heard well, of especially if people are you know are getting this you know that they I don't want to talk about it. I don't want you know I don't want your help. Yeah. What, what I would say is 10 right. years... Don't just leave the kid on the door and right. say, all right, here's... But, you know. but that's where a lot of people, a lot of people encounter yeah. is just a lot of pushback. Yeah. Yeah. And what I would say is 10 years from now, can you look back and say, I did everything I knew to do and tried the best I could, no matter the outcome, mm. and feel that that's what you did versus all the regrets of people I talked to. Like, I knew something was on, but I didn't want to approach the topic, mm -hmm. I, you know, and have those regrets for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I, I wanted to just touch base on, on um, the idea of rapid acting medications yeah. in combination with a treatment like CAMS. Yeah. Um, so you were talking to me before the podcast about an interesting study that you're a part of, and I would love for you to just explain a little bit about the PCORA grant that you recently uh, Secure. Yeah, there are two two studies actually. The one uh, NIMH funded was an, uh, called an R01, um, where we were administering uh, to teenagers and to young adults at the Cleveland Clinic at Mass General IV ketamine, mm -hmm. low dose over an hour, um, and when it works, it's pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be that if they have that on board, and we start CAMS before they get discharged, and then continue it post discharge via telehealth, can we really um, accentuate sort of a somatic and, and psychological intervention mm -hmm. together. Um, and then the control group, they get saline, um, which does nothing, but they'll still get CAMS. So the funders like this, this design because everybody's at least getting CAMS in right. the back end, especially that post-discharge period, which is high risk. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a new German study that shows that, that we can sort of help with that high risk uh, period by decreasing the risk for attempt behaviors. So that study's been charred. It's been, we've had FDA challenges, we've had mm -hmm. our institution review board challenges. Um, there's a lot of exclusion criteria. If people have abused substances, if they have psychotic disorders. And so we've been really, you know, kind of blazing the trail to figure out how do we recruit mm -hmm. a sufficient sample size. So we're still at that. Um, the second more recent uh, trial is a PCORI trial, which is a patient-centered funding um, effort that's really big is comparing the use of um, electroconvulsive therapy. And I personally have seen ECT save lives, mm -hmm. just in my own history as a clinician, um, and then IV ketamine. Mm -hmm. And the and idea- so these are probably treatment-resistant depression patients, right? Acutely so, suicidal, treatment-resistant. Yeah, and where they were like, the, they're just really in dire straits. And so they're using these acute interventions, mm -hmm. um, and then everybody gets CAMS. 
a session before discharge and seven sessions post discharge. Mm -hmm. And that will be 12 medical centers. It's a seven year trial. It's a really big deal. It's and, a really big deal. Uh, we're going to see how it works. But I'm super excited about the idea that we can, we need it all. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I don't, I would never say that CAMS is for everybody mm -hmm. or ECT is for everybody. But, um, but you know, as a doctor, I mean, it's just with, with so many people struggling in this way, we need this and more. Um, and I, I know you're interested in precision treatment medicine. Mm -hmm. I really feel like this is, we were at the cusp of this. We did a study with Brown Kessler at Harvard looking at one of our clinical trials about who would benefit from CAMS and who would benefit from treatment as usual and use machine learning to sort of sort that out and got a really interesting finding. But I am really excited about the prospect, and I think we're on the cusp of this, that we can match different treatments for different mm -hmm. kinds of needs and conditions, different levels of motivation. Mm -hmm. Um, different levels of, uh, of, of severity. And we are now at the cusp, of, I think, of a time where we can realistically start thinking that there are a handful of evidence-based practices. Mm -hmm. um, different people are going to respond differently. A lot of these treatments treat attempts and reduce attempts, but don't touch ideation. Mm -hmm. Others reduce ideation, but don't, touch, don't, don't necessarily reduce attempts. So we really want to get into this business of, of thoughtful routing of patients to treatments that have been proven to be effective for whom they're best suited. That's absolutely what we're most excited about, oh, right? Yeah. We don't want to waste people's time with an intervention that's not going to benefit them because in the long run, it takes away hope, right? I've it tried does. this and I've tried this and this hasn't worked and it's been this many weeks and months and I'm still dealing with this, right? right. What was, by the way, what was the machine learning or what was the metric that moved people into uh, the CAMS group as being more effective for them versus... An algorithm that made no sense. <laughs> but we got a significant finding. Okay. So, uh, but it's yeah. interesting, right? So, be, so a we, series of questions that's filled out. We took, a, we took a randomized control trial of the study that we did at, at Fort Stewart. So basically 150 soldiers. And Ron's idea was take away the treatment arms. Mm -hmm. So control arm and CAMS arm. And then we had 18 measures. Each measure has 50, 60 items. We had baseline one, three, six, nine, 12 months. It's a lot of data. Mm -hmm. So we gave him all that data, and the high-speed computers at Harvard crunched the data for five months, night and day, 24-7, oh. and ultimately, ultimately spit out an, a, an algorithm. Uh -huh. And 78% of the patients would benefit from CAMS, and 22% would benefit from treatment as usual. And so Ron, Ron, Ron was very excited. He's like, you know, JAMA Psychiatry, baby, we're on our way. You know, big publication. He said, we got to analyze for another three weeks, and then we'll know what the algorithm means. And we waited three weeks. He's like, nah, I don't know. He said, we could, we could analyze for another two years and find the deep structure. And I'm like, all right, I'm done. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's just publish what we got. Wow. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it had never been done with an RCT. You know, usually these studies that you probably know are done with like big samples of 3,000 right. veterans, right. Uh, you know, with big samples. So this is a relatively small sample with a lot of data. Yeah. But it, it to me, it opened the door to the idea that we, you know, we don't have one size that fits all. Mm -hmm. We have different tools for different needs. And that's really where medicine and mental health care should go, in my view, in the future. Not only is it better for the patients, it's cost effective, it's going to save money, mm -hmm. and we're going to have better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you what you're most excited about <laughs> as you look at the field of suicidology. It sounds like that might be it, the precision kind of medicine approach to suicide prevention and treatment. I'm also excited about something called the Hope Institute, which is, I was telling about this before the podcast, mm -hmm. just a, a clinic where all they do is mm -hmm. CAMS and DBT. Mm -hmm. They're averting hospital stays, they're averting ED visits, and they're stabilizing kids in 5.2 weeks and adults in six, and all they do is stabilize. Mm -hmm. And the clinicians, Kristen, are on fire mm. because they feel like they're doing God's work. I mean, they really feel like they're doing something powerful and effective because in the real world, people are waiting six, eight, ten weeks or months mm -hmm. to get an outpatient provider. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can create, especially since 988 has created sort of like an awareness right. that we've got a stabilization space that is kind of in fluid, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of in flux and we, we don't quite have the remedies. The Hope Institute is an example of kind of an organic clinic using evidence-based care just to stabilize people. People are given next day appointments. Wow. They're seen up to four times a week. 
they're able to stabilize, and then that they're able to then renegotiate uh, Medicaid mm. because they're saving so much money. So this now has been stood up in uh, Chandler School District in Arizona. There's going to be more uh, Hope Clinics, uh, Hope Institutes in Arizona, and then also uh, there's a pending project at uh, Atlanta Children's Hospital. And it's just an example of what is being done, you know, really in this incredibly exciting space since 988 has now sort of brought into the light of day. Oh, Only 17% of Americans know what 988 is. But oh, really? as we as we grow our knowledge, we really need a new model. Mm. And we really need to think outside the box. Um, and that's where all of these kinds of ideas to me are so exciting and where I think we're going to be saving more lives and decreasing a lot more suffering. Thank you for sharing. I, had, I hadn't heard about these hope centers. So hopefully that model continues to And models expand. like that. I mean, there, there are a number of these that are organically popping up where social workers are, are doing first touch contacts and police are doing backup mm. or technologies are being used. I mean, it really is an exciting time mm -hmm. to, I think, kind of reimagine a model. It's always been you just put somebody in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and that will always have a place, but um, I think we're looking at alternatives to that. Um, that are going to be in the patient's best interest and probably um, providers will find that helpful as well. Perfect. Well, as we kind of close out, I guess I was just going to return to this idea of for the person who has experienced suicidal thoughts, who's struggled with this in their life, maybe number one, number two, number three take-home points for them, if they want to write it down, if, you know, um, they want to commit it to memory. What would you really want to impart to those folks listening? I know that's a hard question. <laughs> no, it's a really good question. <laughs> I think I repetition think, is helpful. Yeah. We all get to be dead forever. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much a given. Mm -hmm. We've got this life to make viable. I absolutely get why people feel like this is the thing they have to do. But so often to me, the tragedy is that they haven't gotten treatment that actually could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't you want to have that treatment? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be better on your dying day if you take your life that you've tried everything, mm -hmm. turned over every stone? Because to me, it's tragic when people die before their time uh, by their own hand, having not tried everything. Mm -hmm. um, that, that to me is a tragedy. And let alone the people that are left behind, as we know, are, is, are traumatized by the loss of a loved one. We've lost patients in trials. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a patient that I tested in the VA that took his life. I had friends who've taken their lives. It's an awful way to lose somebody. But I really feel like with the treatments that are emerging, if they can find them, it gives people a second or third chance. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an absolutist. I, I would never say that, you know, it, this should never ever happen under the, you know, any conceivable condition. I can see how people do this. But to me, short of like something that actually could make a difference, it's a tragedy that could be averted. So that, that I think would be my takeaway is like, before we get to be dead forever, um, is there a way that you could find a way to make it work? Um, and these effective treatments, I think, while they're not widely used, they are emerging and we're trying to create a tipping point here. Yeah. Um, that people could get things that it would actually make a difference and give them a life they want to live. And maybe we'll just t say a couple of those treatments. So CAMS being one of them. CAMS is one of them. Um, behavior therapy is DBT one. is probably the, the best, most studied with dozens of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, there are two cognotherapy interventions called uh, Cognotherapy for Suicide Prevention, or CTSP, and uh, something called Brief Cognitive Therapy, or BCBT. Mm -hmm. There's... Um, uh, a stu uh, intervention developed by Guy Diamond at Drexel called Attachment-Based Family Therapy for Adolescents. It needs replication outside of Guy's lab, but it's a really nice intervention for teenagers on ideation. There's something called Mentalization-Based Therapy, um, which is more popular in the UK, but um, has some nice data um, that I think they need to independently replicate. And there's a really exciting intervention that's now uh, um, being studied called the Attempted Short, Short Suicide Intervention Program, or ASIP. Um, and that was a Swiss intervention, three sessions, um, in which um, they saw an 82% reduction in attempt behaviors after two years follow-up. So we really want to replicate that study because it was such a robust study. Um, and there's about three or four different groups around the world trying to do that. So 
we, we're at a critical mass, I think, of things that we know are effective. We're even writing papers now of what we think are the common factors that cut across the effective interventions. Mm -hmm. We think they have similar mechanisms. Mm -hmm. We think they all involve some way of, in, of educating the patient to who, when, where, and how they become suicidal. They all involve some kind of stabilization planning or a safety plan mm -hmm. or a crisis response plan of how to sort of re-engage prefrontal cortical control. And they almost all involve a way of engaging others more effectively. In the third edition, we have a new intervention called the Stabilization Support Plan, mm -hmm. which is how loved ones can support the person they care about differently better. Mm -hmm. In our Army trial, we always brought in spouses or partners or soldiers in the CAMS arm of the trial. And we saw in the moderator analyses that those folks have more resiliency and greater symptom reduction. So having key people in your life involved in a constructive way seems to be part of the solution as well. So I'm really excited, really hopeful, really so grateful to be on this podcast because there's good news here. Mm -hmm. It's a very challenging topic, but I really believe that we're maybe hitting a tipping point of, of discovery and more lives being saved through thoughtful intervention. Perfect. And if a patient wanted to find a CAMS provider, how would they go about that? Um, well, DBT has a listing for DBT, so uh, uh, behavioral technology has a listing. Uh, there's actually a number of listings for dialectic behavioral therapy. For CAMS, uh, there is the uh, CAMS Care website, so mm -hmm. it's CAMS hyphen care, and there's a clinician locator there. Mm -hmm. And we're building that out. We've got several hundred on that, and we're trying to get into DBT levels, which have thousands of providers. Um, the Beck Institute offers CTSP and BCBT, mm -hmm. or at least CTSP intervention. Um, and then the OSIP training, um, I think, is available, but I'm not sure from where. So, I mean, part of the, the challenge with this is the developers have to actually get into business to scale up their interventions, which is something Marcia uh, told me about early on, um, because we can't save lives as more clinicians don't know. So that's really a big part of the picture. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dave, for being a part of the podcast and taking time. Uh, we so appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. If you're a Wild Health patient, you might not know, but you have access to our referral program. This gets your friends and family 25% off Wild Health services. Just head to Clarity, and in the top right corner, you'll see Refer a Friend. Click there, and you'll be brought to a page with your referral code. Happy sharing.